praise the Lord. Oh, my goodness, that is so, so true. Goodness, I'm telling you, that, those are such great worship and praise, adoration songs, because that's just exactly what Jesus did. Look at your neighbor and say, that's what Jesus did for me. Holy, 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 yeah. He changed my whole life, my destiny. He changed everything about me and about my future and about what's going to happen to me, and this is not the end. Thank, how many of you thank, thank God that this is not as good as it gets, <laughs> right? You know, there are a lot of sad people who think that somehow heaven happens while we're here on earth. I don't know how they come up with that conclusion when the Bible's filled with testimonies and word and scripture, unless you don't think Jesus knows what he's talking about. You know, Jesus described lots of things and says, this is how heaven's going to be, and he gave uh, stories, uh, and when I say stories, I'm not talking about parables. There's a difference between the stories Jesus tells and the parables Jesus used. I don't know if you're aware of this, but a parable is just basically a story lay, laid aside a truth that illustrates that truth, and Jesus tells them all the time because he's talking about such wild things that, they, that the disciples don't have any idea what he's talking about. So he says, well, think of it like this. You know, a guy went and sowed seed in the field and the field, you know, began to grow. And then in the field, all the good stuff that Jesus sowed was there, but then the enemy came and sowed tares. Uh, everybody say weeds, weeds in the field. And, and then they go, what in the world are you talking about? And he said, well, the field is the world. And and the good sower of seed is the son of man. And the guy that sows, goes, sows uh, weeds is the, is the devil. He's the enemy, you know. And all, I mean, That's a parable. But when Jesus names somebody, if, it, if, it, if, it, if that guy didn't exist and if that wasn't his name and Jesus is saying, I'm going to tell you a story about somebody and he uses their name and they didn't really exist and this is not a real story, then Jesus just told us a lie. And I don't think Jesus lies, do you? So when he tells us stuff like there was a rich man and then there was this poor guy named Lazarus who laid at the, at the, at the gate of the rich man every day and the rich man fared sumptuously and Lazarus was a beggar laying at the gate. The rich man died and went to hell and when he was in hell, he lifted up and he saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom say, heaven... And then he, and, and, and the rich man said, tell Lazarus to go dip his finger in the, in the water and come down here and tip it on my tongue because I'm being tormented in these flames. Yeah, yeah. Well, if there really wasn't a Lazarus and there really wasn't a rich man, Jesus just told us a lie because he said there was a man named Lazarus and there was a rich man. That's not a parable. That's a truth that Jesus is saying, illustrated by a real person, two real people that lived real lives here on this earth and he's telling us what happens after you die and the fact that that ghost you thought you saw or that mama or daddy that you're talking to is not them. It could possibly be a demon imitating them, but it's not really them because that doesn't exist, guys. All of this clairvoyance and these wackos going around psychologically inducing memories and so forth on people, all those are sophisticated con artists that gets you to feed them the information they're going to relate back to you without you even knowing that you're giving it to them. They're guessing. They're excellent profilers. They're con men and, and sleight of hand men and confidence men who can read you and, and lead you to think that, that they're telling you something that you haven't revealed to them. It's ridiculous. No such thing as ghost. I don't know how I got off into this, but... Maybe, maybe somebody here needs to know this. Am I talking to somebody? I mean, you've been wondering, well, I talked to mama last night. No, you didn't. Mama's either in heaven or hell, one or the other. You're not talking to mama. You may be talking to a demon imitating mama, which I can understand that because the enemy of your soul is trying to lead you to destruction and get you out there in some wild fantasy land believing stuff that doesn't even exist. So you can get distracted and not focus on Jesus, who is the true redeemer, who can take you to the foot of the cross and change your life so that it'll never be the same again. You're not going to get any information from the far beyond the dead. Jesus went on in that story of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man says, tell Lazarus to come dip his finger in the water and come down and touch it to my tongue, for I'm tormented in these flames. He's in hell. And you know what Jesus said to him? Jesus said he can't do it. Mm -hmm. 
Because between us and you is this great gulf that is fixed that no man that would want to go from there to you could pass through this gulf and nobody from you to, to there could pass through this gulf. And then the, then the rich man said, well, send Lazarus that he might, tell, he might talk to my brothers who are still alive. I have five brothers that they wouldn't come to this horrible place where I am. In other words, send them back from the dead. Send Lazarus back and let him go talk to my brothers and tell them, whatever you do, don't come to this horrible place because I'm their brother and I'm testifying that hell is true, hell is real, and you don't want to go there. And you know what Jesus said to the, to the rich man? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. In other words, you have the word of God. The word of God tells you everything you need to know about how to get to heaven and what you need to do. And if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to listen to somebody that rises from the dead. So Jesus is saying, people don't go back from heaven and lead you around and that, you know, daddy's on my shoulder watching everything that happens. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Daddy's not in heaven looking down on you, making sure nothing bad happens to you. If he, if he could, if somebody from heaven could watch all of us they loved on earth, how sad would heaven be? Heaven wouldn't be heaven for them, right? It'd be, it'd be torment and torture. It'd be, you idiot, what are you doing? Come on, get real. I mean, imagine what they would be saying from heaven. From heaven, they'd be going, what? You are looking at what? Get off of that thing, you know? Or you just said, what? I mean, imagine the torment that they would be receiving. Heaven would be hell to people that could watch us be goofy here on this earth. It'd be ridiculous because they love us and they know what's going to happen to us. So no, 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 no. Daddy's not riding on your shoulder. Mama's not speaking in your ear. Jesus said that if, even if, I, even if they, I wanted them to go back, I'm not sending any back because I've already sent somebody back. You say, you know, he said... Even if one would rise from the dead, those five brothers wouldn't believe them. And I'm saying to you, somebody did rise from the grave. The only one that's ever been dead and lives again is Jesus Christ. Jesus did rise from the grave. And you know what he said? He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Not one of the ways, one of the truths, or one of the lies. I am the one and only way. Not one of many, not Confucius and Mohammed and Krishna and Buddha and everybody else. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. And no one, look at your neighbor and say, not even you. No one gets, comes to the Father but by me. And he said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, you will be always. And the way you know, and Thomas said, Lord, we don't know the way. And we don't even know what you're talking about. And then he said, well, just so you won't be confused, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes by me. So what I'm saying to you is that all of this clairvoyance and psychological mumbo-jumbo junk and all these psychic mystic deals and all that kind of mess is just an illusion to keep you distracted from what really is the spiritual part of your life. Don't get caught up by con men who are imitating. I'm not saying they're not spiritually empowered. I'm just telling you it's not the Holy Spirit that's empowering the Bible says this world is full of spiritual battle. If you could see around you right now in the spirit realm, and I don't want to sound too spooky, but the Bible says there is a realm of the spirit where battles are going on around you right now. And if you could see into that dimension, what you would see is you would see the angels and the spirits of God warring against demons and the spirits of evil uh, that are bombarding all around you. And that's why the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 says, you know what you need to do? You need to wake up every day and you need to put on the whole armor of God that you might withstand the evil one and having done all to stand, put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, 
Have, your, have the belt of truth around your waist. Have your feet uh, shod with the, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And take the shield of faith with which you can quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray with all supplications that your requests be made known to God. And the, and the God of peace, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Man, the whole world is crying, peace, 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 peace. I don't know if you've noticed it, but in the last 12 months, 18 months, six months, two days, four, four hours, right now all over the world, there's more and more an outcry, peace, give us peace, give us peace. You know, North Korea and South Korea, 70 years, they've been still in war. Finally, they're at least talking about, we're going to make some kind of treaty and get this thing over with and peace and peace and the whole world's going, man, I'm telling you, peace is going to get to this earth and China's kind of, you know, stepped back and said, let's have peace. And then Russia, you know, who now is just a little third-rate power. I don't know why we're even afraid of them. I mean, Russia, Russia used to be a part of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was a union of states, just like the United States, a whole bunch of states that made up a union called the Soviet Union. Well, with Mr. Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan, they, they said, hey, we're going to quit being a union. And we dissolved the union. Now we're just a bunch of individual states. It would be like the United States saying, we're not the United States anymore. We're just states. So Russia would be like the state of Texas. And I'm just asking you, what in the world could the state of Texas do against the power of the United States of America? What are we afraid of? Third world bunch of, you know, reprobates that can't even fight their way out of a paper sack. I mean, they're going to really do something. We could send one aircraft carrier and just kill the whole country. I mean, just bloom, blow them off the face of God's earth. They're nothing. Just one of many states now that used to make up a big union that used to be pretty powerful because there was a whole bunch of them. Now they're out here swinging in the breeze by themselves. A lot of their countries have become democratic and said capitalism is what we're after and they don't even belong to that mindset or philosophy anymore. I'm just saying to you that this old world that we are living in have has begun to bear the birth pains of the realities of what the Bible says will be happening in the days just before Christ comes. I was telling the, the, the prayer group that, that some cat named Buck Minister Fuller, which I've never heard his name, I just happened to be cruising and, and typed uh, knowledge of the world, and it boom, one of the sites that opened up was this cat named Buck Minister Fuller, who, de who developed in 1982 a formula, a mathematical formula called uh, the knowledge doubling curve. It was a mathematical formula that measured all of the knowledge of the world and talked about how often this knowledge will double. And his conclusion, I mean, this is a real deal. This is not, you know, some cartoon cat that nobody pays attention to, even though I don't know who he is. You know, obviously he was a mathematics genius or whatever, and, and he's relied on to know this formula, knows what it's talking about. And he came to the conclusion, just so you'll know, that in, in, the, in the 19 centuries bef be before, of course, 1900, knowledge on this earth doubled Every 100 years, every 100 years, the earth would know more than it did 100 years ago. So every 100 years, knowledge would double. Beginning in 1900, by the time you get to 1970, knowledge was doubling. Now get this, remember, 100 years, 100 years, 100 years, knowledge doubles, double, 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 double. In the, in the 70 years between 1900 and 1970, knowledge doubled again, starting in 19... So now we're down to 70 years. In 1970 to 1990, knowledge doubles again. So now you're down to every 25 years, every 30 years. From 1990 
on to about 2002 or three or four, uh, knowledge doubled again. So now you're down to every 12 years and so forth. From, not, from about 2002 or three until 2016, knowledge doubles again, about 13 years now. And now he says, and I get this, two, we're in 2018, right? I mean, I'm on, I am in the right time. In 2018, knowledge doubles, and this is going to blow your mind, every 12 hours. Every 12 hours, the amount of knowledge, accumulated knowledge of humanity on this earth doubles in 12 hours of time. What, it, what, it, what is that saying to you? That is saying, when we read in the book of Revelation in just a few chapters from here, that one of the things, no, this is in Matthew, but Jesus is talking about the, the end times, and he says one of the signs will be that, 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 that men shall run to and fro. Everybody say travel fast. He said one of, the, one of the signs of the time is that men shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. And I'm just saying to you that Jesus told us as we approach the end, one of the signs that says we're in the season of departure is that travel is going to be almost instantaneous. And again, men are going to travel over the world at breakneck speeds and, and increased ease and capability. And knowledge is just going to get blown out of, the, out of the window. And we wear watches that have all the knowledge of the world, blah, 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 find it. We have them in our back pockets and, you know, blah, 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 type it in. But the, there you have it. You're in, the, you're in the library in Jerusalem. You're in, you know, you're in, in some big accumulated museum somewhere and you can look at everything in there and we carry it around in our pocket or wear it on our arm. And I, I'm just saying to any thinking soul, these are signs of the season of the departure that Jesus said is going to happen on this earth. And a lot of those things I listed for you on the first part of your outline I just put that, those are major things. There, I mean, there could be, I could, I could triple this list. I could quadruple this list with things that, you, it, that would matter to you other than these 15 or 16 things I have listed here. Those are just really big things that affect everybody in the world. And I, I did that to illustrate who could have thought so much could happen so fast. Good night, man. The fall of the Berlin Wall. <laughs> the wall that separated East Germany from West Germany. The wall that separated capitalism and democracy from communism. If communism is so good, which we have quacks and idiots nowadays protesting on TV to go back to that silly mess... If it's so good, why don't they have to build walls around their country to keep people from getting in? The walls they build is to keep their own citizens from trying to run away. When the, you may not be aware of this, but when the Berlin Wall was torn down and they had to have, they had to have a zone around the Berlin Walls where they, the communist side, they had to have machine gunners manning it so that if some of the citizens of communists tried to climb over the wall, which they tried to tunnel through and go around and go over all the time, and those machine gunners would just gun them dead right there on the spot, trying to escape that crazy, um, isolated, ridiculous kind of life, that poverty-driven, desperate kind of life where somebody's telling you everything to do and not do and controlling how much you make and don't make. You're starving to death. Your children are slaves and blah, blah, blah. And they would gun them down so they couldn't escape and become propaganda for how bad it is in communism and how good it is in capitalism. Well, when Mr. Reagan told Gorbachev, tear this wall down, and he actually did, and the wall began to come down, this is something you may not know. The citizens of East Germany, everybody say the communist, the communists started running over the wall so fast that they left their homes just like they lived in them. They left, the, they left the lights on or the fan running and all their possessions. They left their kids. I mean, it's like, hey, everybody fitting for yourself. This wall may not be open that long. Let's get out of here while we can. 
I mean, they just left life as they knew it. They didn't even take a suitcase with them or anything because they were so excited to be free to run away from that mess. That's a big deal, man. But I'm going to tell you something even greater than that. Let me tell you the greatest miracle that's ever happened in the history of this world. I mean, you take the coming of Christ and Christ coming to save us from our sins is the greatest thing that's ever happened. But a physical event that is, that is tremendously important and vital to all this world happened on May 14, 1948 at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. A flag went up a flagpole and a little tiny dot on the map called Israel. And for the first time in 2,000 years, do you hear me? the first time in 2,000 years there existed on this earth a nation named Israel. Since 70 AD when Titus, the Roman general, strolled into the city of Jerusalem and demolished everything in the city of Jerusalem, he did not leave one stone upon another. He destroyed the temple. The only thing that remained and the reason they even have a wailing wall now is this is part of the temple that was underground. Do you hear me? Everything that was above the ground, Titus, the Roman general, destroyed it, knocked it down, and there did not exist a temple in Jerusalem. And over the years, through archaeology and digging it up, they found a wall that was a foundation wall that used to be the wall of the temple, and they dug it out, and now it's called the Wailing Wall. Now it's where everybody goes and puts those little prayers in there and those little requests, and all the Jews stand before it and bow and all of that because it's a holy shrine. It was a foundation wall under the grounds. The only reason Titus didn't destroy it and then he plowed the land with plows and sowed salt in the land so they couldn't grow anything there. Just like Jesus said when he looked into Jerusalem and he started weeping and wailing, and the disciples said, what's wrong, Lord? And, he, and Jesus saw 70 years into the future and said, the temple is going to be destroyed and, and the Jews are going to be scattered over the earth. And he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you under my arms like a mother chick does her, the mother hen does her chicks, but you would not. And he weeps and wails over the destruction of, of Jerusalem and the lifeblood of the people. Well, from 70 AD until 19, May, May 14, 1948, there was no Israel. The Jews were scattered to the four corners of the earth. The Jews were in every country around the world. America had some, Russia had some, Germany had some, China had some, India had some, Japan had some. And all of these Jews tried to go into the country they were in and establish themselves as citizens of that country, live a life as an American or a Jap Japanese or a Russian or, a, or whatever they might be. They tried to incorporate themselves into the lifeblood of whatever country they were in trying to become a citizen of that country and, listen, and forget about Israel. But the Holy Spirit wouldn't let them do it because no matter where they were, there was something in their heart that longed for Jerusalem, longed for Israel. The Holy Spirit fanned the flame and blew on the embers and said, you're in Japan, but one of these days you're going to go home. You're in the U.S., but one of these days you're going home. And the Holy Spirit is breathing on the ember of passion for the land of Israel because God's not finished with them yet. And prophecy said that Israel will be back in its country, that Israel will have a temple rebuilt on, uh, on the original site of Solomon's temple. By the way, right now, the original site of Solomon's temple has a mosque on it. And in case you don't know, mosque means Islam. It has a mosque built right on the site where Solomon's temple stood in the Old Testament. What's going to happen? Well, the Antichrist is going to give the Jews the desires of their heart in order to trick them into thinking that he's their friend. I mean, it's important that the Antichrist win the confidence of Israel and convince them that he loves them and that he's going to protect them and that he is their friend. This all happens. We're going to get to this. this Revelation is full of this stuff. 
We're just right now about to enter into exactly what you want to know about everything to do with what happens in the future. I'm just kind of trying to wet your taste buds a little bit. I wasn't even planning to preach on this, so if somebody's here that needs to hear this, I don't know what you're, I don't know why. I'm not even in what I was even going to talk about. But here we go. Those of you that are around long enough, I try to be obedient to the Spirit of God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. But, but the Mosque of Omar sits right on the temple site. Well, in order for Solomon's temple to be rebuilt, the Mosque of Omar has got to be torn down. Can you imagine what kind of stink that's going to cause? Can you imagine what kind of diplomacy and how much persuasion and how much charisma and all of that kind of stuff the Antichrist is going to have to have to spit in the face of Islam and say, okay, tear that mosque down and then allow the Jews to rebuild the temple on that same spot. Whoo! What is CNN and MSNBC and Fox? And what, are the, what are they going to do? And ABC, NBC, CBS, blah, 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 blah. What are all, the, what are all, those, what are all those networks going to do with that? What kind of protests are going to pop out about that? The Jews are the most hated people on the face of the earth, just barely ahead of Christians. All of these other wing religions are basically honored nowadays. I don't know if you've noticed that. Nobody talks bad about them. Nobody says anything. They have all these weird stuff and all of this crazy theology and all of these dictates and terrorism and everything else attached to them. But, oh, they're the greatest. It's the spirit of Antichrist. You say, what kind of lunacy is this? It's just delusion is all it boils down to. It's craziness. But that's the way the Bible describes the world we live in in the days that approach this great event that we're about to talk about. Because this great event that I'm about to describe to you is a trigger. It triggers everything that follows. When this trigger is pulled, everything begins to happen quickly after that. It's all based on timing after that. It just happens and then boom, 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 boom in succession like birth pains come upon a woman who's pregnant when it's time for the baby to be born. Everything begins to happen rapidly and every, every day or every month it just gets closer and closer and closer and closer. Any of you that know anything about childbirth know that once labor starts, it, gets, it starts out with a painful situation and contractions, and then they get closer together and harder, closer together and harder, closer together and harder, until finally the child gets, birth, gets pushed into the birth chamber, and buddy, we're on our way to a birth. I'm just saying to you that, the, that a new age is going to be birthed. We have in, in the history of the world what is called dispensations. I, I, I don't want to get too technical about it. But dispensations just mean period of time where God deals with the earth in certain ways. There are time periods that can be categorized of how God dealt with people on earth over a period of time. The first one is called innocence, when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and they didn't know, where, they didn't know about sin and they hadn't disobeyed and blah, blah, blah. God dealt with them in innocence. When they, when they ate and broke the law, they moved into a new dispensation called conscious. They were conscious of their sin. They knew they were sinners. They were banished to the garden and, uh, and, and cherubim angels protected it and guarded it. So the first dispensation would be called innocence. God dealt with them in a certain way. The second dispensation was called conscience and God dealt with them in, in, in a certain way. And then the next di dispensation, you know, would, would, would be the dispensation of human government where Noah, you know, was on the ark and the world flooded and then Noah and his family came off the earth and the earth was covered and, and was governed by Noah and his family, the only ones that were left on the earth and so forth. And so you have another dispensation and then you have the dispensation of promise where God makes a covenant with Abraham and all the earth will be blessed from you and, and the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea and all of that kind of stuff. And God dealt with man through, through a covenant of peace. 
And then Moses comes along and you have law where God deals with the earth through obey the law. Here are the Ten Commandments. Obey through the law and blah, blah, blah. And you have that dispensation of time. And then comes Jesus' birth on the earth. And now we live in a dispensation of grace where it's the grace of God that rules how God deals with you. Grace just means God gives you something you don't deserve. You, you deserve to die and go to hell. Because you're a sinner. We all deserve that. Not a single one of us. I mean, as great as I am, <laughs> I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We're a sinner. We're all sinners. But the grace of God makes available to us heaven, even though we don't deserve to go to heaven. We deserve to go to hell. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans says. And so in this dispensation of time, God gives us grace. At the end of the period of grace comes the, comes the period of the kingdom of God, where God sits on a throne and rules with a rod of iron. It's called the millennial kingdom of Christ. He sits on a judgmental throne and judges this earth, right or wrong, rod of iron. You don't sin. You don't rebel. You obey the law and blah, blah, blah. I'm just saying to you, we are at the birth of a new dispensation. We're near the end of grace. And when grace shuts the door, we, God will no longer deal with men through grace. You better get in before that door is shut. Because once that door is shut, grace is <laughs> pretty much over. Oh, there will be a few pay, people saved in the, in the tribulation, but, I, but I'm telling you, it would be horrible. It would be horrible to live running from everybody, the government trying to kill you, the Antichrist trying to destroy you. You'll be martyred and killed and burned. I doubt whether, seriously, I doubt whether right now sitting in an air-conditioned sanctuary with an altar right here open, if you don't have enough courage and guts and spunk and spizzerinkum to walk down an aisle and say, I want to receive Christ in this easy day, whether you'll have enough courage whenever it means you're taking your life when you come to Christ. But even if you did, the Bible tells you're not going to be one of them. I know there are going to be some people saved in the tribulation period. We'll talk about it. The book of Revelation tells us that. There are going to be people on this earth who come to Christ during that seven years of tribulation that will be described in chapter 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, all this revelation, and it's just wild, and I'm going to tell you it's unbelievably amazing. Don't miss any of the future. There will be some people saved, but it ain't going to be you. Because once you've had an opportunity on this side, everybody say, in grace. Once you've had an opportunity to know what I'm telling you now and you don't respond to it because you love to sin rather than love to obey God, because you have more pleasure in your sinfulness and wickedness than you do love for Christ and righteousness, you shut the door on your own life and God is going to send you strong delusion so that you'll believe anything that comes out of the mouth of the Antichrist. Like, poo, E.T. has finally come home, man. <laughs> and you'll go, yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Listen, men, open your eyes. You have a Holy Spirit on the inside of you that screams out, this is true or this is not true. Quit taking the bait of the enemy that is the enemy of your soul, the enemy of Christ the enemy of values, the enemy of morals that are trying to convince you that all of these crazy things are okay and that God didn't really mean it when he said, thou shalt not kill or steal or be disobedient. I mean, God, I, you know, that's optional. You can do it or not. If it passes the Supreme Court, it's okay. We got something higher than the Supreme Court. We got, a, we got a grace court in heaven that says this is right and this is wrong. And I don't care what the law of that land says. Just because it might say something doesn't mean it's right. God says what's right and wrong. And if you can be for something that is directly opposed to God, you need to examine your heart. 
Because God is trying to show us something. He's saying, open your eyes. And all of these passages I'm about to read to you, he's saying, I don't want you to be ignorant. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, uninformed. That's what the word ignorant means, uninformed. I don't want you to not have the right information you need to make right decisions. So he starts telling us, this is what you need to know. Now, let me just show you so that I can actually get into my message now that it's time to quit. But let me just show you, and I'm going to do them rapidly, okay? Everybody look and shake your head and say, oh, yeah, I know. Okay. Okay, I got you. I got you. But I am. I'm, I, got, I'm, I mean, those Presbyterians have been, been winning all along, right? I mean, they've gotten to the chicken first before you. I, I'd, uh, maybe we can get you there first today. Okay, let's look at them. All right, this is out of 1 Thessalonians 5. This is the Apostle Paul. He says a few things before this at chapter 4, right at the end, and we're going to read that passage, so don't get all nervous about, I don't know what he said before, because it looks like we're coming in in the middle of a conversation, and we are. But I want you to see this first, okay? And then we'll go back to and let you see the three or four verses before this. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write you. So the Apostle Paul says, look, it's, I don't need to tell you everything because I know you already know this. So what does he need to tell them that they don't already know? You, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Okay, so he's saying... All of you know that nobody knows when Christ is coming, you know, because if you knew when Christ was coming, you would prepare for that moment when he comes. But since he's, he's not announcing that he's coming, just like a thief doesn't send you a letter or text you or, or what, what, what is God, uh, Twitter you or whatever that thing is, tweet you and whatever. He, he doesn't do it and say, oh, by the way, you leave your door unlocked. I'm coming now tonight to steal a bunch of stuff from you. I mean, a thief doesn't announce in advance that he's coming. You only know he's come after he's gone. And you discover what he took. And you say, my goodness, man, somebody broke in the house and stole my, you know, butter beans out of the freezer or whatever. <laughs> so now you know a thief has been here, but it's too late now because he's already been there and gone. And to see Jesus described as a thief is kind of a, a, a counterproductive thought, Right? Jesus is the lily of the valley, the bright morning star, the truth, the way, the life. He's the lily of the valley, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's lots of things, but a thief? Jesus said, yeah, I'm, I'm heaven's thief. Heaven's thief is different from earth's thief. You know how? Earth's thief steals stuff that doesn't belong to him. Heaven's thief only steals stuff that does belong to him. And so just like a thief who comes in the night and you don't know when he's coming... He takes what belongs to him out of this earth. This is called, this event is called the rapture. Everybody say upgathering. Okay. That's what the word means, an upgathering. And so when, when I use the word rapture, and when we go into the rest of the book of, of, of Revelation, I'm going to use that term rapture. And you're going to try to look up in your Bible concordances the word rapture. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you that it's not there. You know why it's not there? Because the Bible doesn't use the word rapture. That is a word made up to describe an event that is called the upgathering. So instead of saying the upgathering every time you come to the concept, we have created a word rapture that means the upgathering. So that word is going to be mentioned a lot of times, but here's what I want you to know. Look at what it says. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Okay, it's going to happen when you don't know it, when you don't expect it, when it's not announced. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. He's just saying, as this world begins to cry more and more for peace and safety, just like you see it happening now, China is saying, peace be unto you, Japan, peace be unto you, India, peace be unto you, Pakistan, peace be unto you, Saudi Arabia. This is something that you don't know. I mean, this is just a weird, and I, you know, I'm sorry to be so political about these conversations, but I'm going to tell you in these days to come, I'm not going to, I, to talk about the reality of what this word is saying, I'm going to have to talk about the, what's really happening. 
And I'm not, I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, independent, I don't care what you are. I'm not trying to talk about somebody's party or whatever. I'm just telling you what the word of God says. That's my responsibility. And if I have to talk around things, you're not going to know what I'm talking about. And if I have to titter-tatter and piddle-paddle on political correctness, it, it's not going to matter. It's ridiculous. The Bible tells the truth. And I'm responsible for the truth as I see it. I may not be right, but I, I'm held responsible for, for letting you know these things. I'm a minister of the gospel. I'm not a minister of some government or whatever. But one of the things that you know people just are not aware of, just to show you how much things have changed for the past 25 years or, or more, I'm talking about with, with presidents like, you know, like, like Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, uh, Bill Clinton, George Bush, W. Bush, George Bush, H. W. Bush, uh, Barack Obama, Obama, and now uh, uh, Donald Trump. OPEC, the, the, a, big, a big cartel, a big union of all the oil producing Arab states has basically run the, the prices of oil in this world. If they say we're going to cut it off and give 500 barrels a day, the oil price goes way up, and then they release a bunch of oil and, and do 5,000 barrels instead of 500 barrels, and the, and, and the price goes down. All through those presidencies I just named you, all of those presidents and all of those administrations have, have tried to console OPEC, have tried to woo and, uh, and, and seduce OPEC to do what they wanted them to do so gas prices in America and all of that would be stable and go down and blah, blah. And basically, OPEC has thumbed their nose in the face of them and, 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 told, you know, and given them the signal that they're number one in the world you know, and, um, and, and, and said, we'll do what we want to do. A couple of weeks ago, this just shows you now, a couple of weeks ago, our current president, Donald Trump, sent a tweet. Look at it, look at it, look it up on the internet. I'm sure it's there. He sent a tweet. You're not going to hear the news talk about it because this would show that he's successful and they certainly don't want to do that. But he sent a tweet. Now listen to what I'm about to say. A tweet to the king of Saudi Arabia. The, the largest oil producer in the world, the leader of OPEC. And he said, because there is so much instability in Iran and North, uh, and North Korea, we're going to need you to open up two, billion bar two million barrels of oil every day. We're going to need for you, Saudi Arabia, to start producing two million barrels a day more because the price of oil is going too high and we need you to release more so the price will go down. And you know what the king of Saudi Arabia said? Okay, done. Our president is leading OPEC to bow at his feet and kiss his feet where for 25 years, no American president has been able to get the time of day from OPEC or any of his countries. How does that happen? It happens through a spirit. It happens through a, through a time where peace and safety and cooperation and all of that is beginning to be the cry of the world. We're tired of terrorism. We're tired of violence. We're tired of, of being in conflict with each other. We, we you know, uh, whatever you need, let's do it. Let's come together. North and South Korea, first time in 70 years. I mean, good night is just the spirit of cooperation. And, 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 and Paul says, when you see peace and safety being cried out for by every nation in the world, be aware that sudden destruction is about to come upon them. And that sudden destruction happens with a trigger. And the trigger is when me and you get carried out of this world. That's the next event on the prophetic calendar. And there are three realities, and let me give them to you quickly. First, the return of Christ is an event, not a process. Yeah, the coming of Christ is not some uh, generalized concept that it happens in the spiritual realm and we don't know about it. 
It's a real event. It's a real happening. It really happens. Just like the Bible says. You'll see it in just a moment. But let me tell you why, what some people believe about a process. Why I even have to say something like that. There are Bible teachers and Bible preachers. I wouldn't call them Christian, but there are Bible teachers and Bible preachers that say that the rapture is not an event. The rapture is a process. Now follow, follow. That, that when you come to Christ as a Christian, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in your heart. All right, everybody say, that's true. And here's what they say. They say, once the Holy Spirit comes and lives in your heart, you begin a process on the inside of you where for the rest of your days, you are being advanced by the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you closer and closer and closer to heaven. What a joke that is. That's what's supposed to happen, but that's not most of what happens. Think about your own life and tell me that you're gentler, more loving, sweeter, patient, kind, obedient, and blah, blah now than the day you got saved. It should be that way, but that's kind of counterproductive to what we know is really happening in a lot of our lives. We usually bump and, and leapfrog and thwart along the way, taking three steps forward and two steps back and five steps forward and one step back. And five, We might generally be a little closer, but it's not progressively going. But, but, the, but, the, but the thought, the process thought is, from the day we get saved, we are slowly in the process of, of being raptured. Uh, and on the day we die, we complete the process of rapture. On the day we die, then we go to home to be with Jesus. So what they teach is the rapture is a progressive process that happens from the day you're saved until the day you die. So right now, you are in the midst of a rapture is what they teach. You're in the process of that. Now, the Bible teaches that when the, when, when, when the rapture happens, the next event, you'll see this in Revelation, I'm telling you, I'm just trying to prepare you for a little bit of what's coming. It's something else. You, I said it before, you don't want to miss it. It's unbelievable. It's, it's amazing how much information God gives us. It's, it'll blow your mind. But, but, but in the, in the, after the rapture comes seven years of tribulation, and at the end of tribulation, there's this battle called Armageddon. Jesus wins it, and all the enemies are killed, and blah, blah. And then Jesus comes down, and he, and he binds up Satan for a little season, and he sets up a throne called the kingdom, the millennial kingdom. And for a thousand years, millennial just means a thousand, and for a thousand years, Jesus sits on a throne, his throne of, the, of his father David, and he rules the world with a rod of iron, and sin is gone and Satan is gone and deception is gone. Deceit is gone. Wickedness is gone. And Jesus rules with a rod of iron and nobody disobeys and the world lives in perfect harmony and beauty, kind of like the Garden of Eden almost. So what these process teachers are saying is that you are consistently right now living the millennial reign of Christ, that he's in your heart, that the Holy Spirit is inside of you, that you are progressively moving toward the rapture and the millennial kingdom is living inside of you where you're, you know, where the Bible says you get a new body, you get a new life, you, you know, everything about you, you don't get old, you don't get aged, you don't get crepit, the lion's going to lay down with the lamb, the serpent's going to, child's going to be able to handle the serpent, all that kind of stuff happens in the millennium. Now, to any thinking man, I'm thinking this. Can you be convinced that you're in the millennium right now? When you go look in the mirror, do you look like something that's in the millennium? Uh-huh. I mean, when, you're, when, 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 you're, when, you're, when your teeth and, and your stomach and your hair all come out, does that, does that sound like a millennial body? When you sink your teeth into an apple and they stay there, I mean, is that the millennial kingdom? When that twinkle in your eyes caused by the sun reflecting off of your bifocal lenses, does that, I mean, is that the kingdom life? Come on. I mean, I can look at myself and I can say, this is not what I dreamed of the millennial body of Christ. But the big test is, can you take a lion in a cage and take a lamb and put it in there and come back the next morning and the lamb is still alive? Oh, it's no, it's no miracle for the lion to lay down with the lamb. The miracle is that both of them get up. 
Well, in the millennial, the lion's gonna lay down with a lamb and both of them are gonna get up. The little baby's gonna play with a poisonous serpent and he's not gonna kill him. That's the millennium. Those are the events that happen in the millennium. So I'm just telling you the fact that some people would say that the, the rapture as a process is ludicrous. What does the Bible have to say about it? Look at this real quick. This is Acts 1. I'm just going to use three little collections of Scripture. And I, they're all listed in your outline. But, and while they looked steadfastly, this is the disciples, and Jesus is talking to them on the mountain and so forth, the mountain where he's going to transfer back and forth, which he's done a lot at the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, which, by the way, is now the capital of Israel. Boom, another prophecy fulfilled. And while they looked steadfastly, Toward heaven. Uh, who's looking? They all are. They're all standing there looking at heaven. As he went up, he's being lifted, levitated off the earth, going back up into heaven. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Everybody said a couple of angels came down. Maybe Michael, maybe Gabriel, both of them standing there going, come on, Jesus, we've been missing you. While also, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus Everybody say, not a counterfeit, not an imposter, not a substitute. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will also come in like manner as you saw him go up into heaven. Well, how did he go up? He just levitated right off this earth and just floated right on up into heaven. What does Acts say, Acts 1? He's going to come back down, flow back down. This same Jesus, not in some imposter, not some stand-in, not some, some other person, but Jesus himself is going to do this. Now, unless you believe God doesn't know what he's talking about and he would lie to you, this is what he says is going to happen. Notice in 1 Thessalonians 4, I told you the three or four verses that come before verse chapter 5 where he said, you know, I don't want you to be ignorant. These are the verses that come right before chapter 5, right at the end of 1 Thessalonians 4. Look at what it says. But I don't want you to want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Everybody say died. That's just a polite, gentle way of saying some people die. The reason he says this is because evidently somebody's upset and confused about dead people. Some, some probably whack off of some news anchor agency somewhere. Probably looked at one of them one day and said, well, you know, all of you Christians think that Jesus was coming back before you die. And I'm telling you that I see Christians dying every day. And evidently, uh, those that died, man, they're just out of luck because they ain't going to be here when Jesus comes back. And so to that crazy thought, here's what the Apostle Paul says the Holy Spirit revealed to him. He says, don't worry if you die before Jesus comes back because there's a provision for you who die before Jesus comes back. You're not going to miss out because you're not standing on the earth and can be caught up. Notice what he said. But concerning those who have fallen asleep, that have died, lest you sorrow as others having no hope. So look, don't get all bent out of shape like this old crazy carnal lost world we live in who wail at the graveside and cry at funerals because they don't have any hope of seeing them again. I don't, that, frankly, I don't know how people that don't have Christ in their heart handle things like that. But we don't handle it like that because we know this is not the end. We know it's not over. We know they'll be waiting for us in heaven on the other side. And that they're actually experiencing something that is so magnificent if you looked at them and said, come back, come back, come back. They'd say, are you crazy? We would never, you come to me. Hey, <laughs> come on. So Jesus said, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and everybody say, we do. If you don't believe that, you're not saved. Because Romans said, I must believe in my heart that Jesus Christ rose from the grave, and I must confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and thou shalt be saved. Those are the two things it takes to be saved. So if you don't believe Jesus rose from the grave, you better, you, you better get your heart right. You're going to get left behind. For even God, uh, that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Granny's coming with Jesus. Papa's coming with Jesus. Baby's coming with Jesus. Stillborn used to be coming with Jesus. 
but they won't be stillborn anymore. They're fully alive. Abortion's coming with Jesus, but they're not going to be aborted babies that people call fetuses because it makes them feel better. They're people, and they're coming with Jesus, but they're not going to be a baby anymore. Think about it. People want to call babies cherubs. Do you know what a cherub is? A cherub is an angel described in the Bible as next to the archangels or the highest order of angels God has. These are war angels, right? Rick, they're terrifying. They have six wings and they have eyes all around them. And they were sent to guard the, the tree of life by God in the Garden of Eden so Adam and Eve couldn't come back in there and eat of the tree of life and live forever separated from God. For their protection, God put cherubim angels with flaming swords of fire. That's a cherubim. A cherubim is not a little cherub. Oh, this is a sweet little baby angel. Pooh. <laughs> You'll never be an angel, by the way. People believe that kind of craziness. Angels are created by God as angels. They're always angels. You are not an angel. You are a son of God. When you get to heaven, you will be a son or daughter of God. You, 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 you can't slip to a lower order. Angels wish they could be you. So you'll never be an angel. When you die, you don't go to heaven and be an angel. Who taught you that? It's ridiculous. That's some of that Catholic theology mess or something. That goofy purgatory junk. There's no purgatory. You either here or there. Jesus said to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. There's no time for some intervening period where somebody can pay some money and some priest, you know, pray you out of somewhere. It's ridiculous. People, hell's full of people that believe that mess. Don't be uninformed. The only true answer we have is the word of God. And that's what it says. And so some of you are already going to be with Jesus. And he says, I'm going to bring you back. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of Christ will by no means precede those who sleep. So we're not going to get an advance notice. As a matter of fact, let me just go on and keep reading because he says some more about that. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. A shout means... Uh, you shout when you have victory. You know, how many of you know that a lion never roars until he's knocked his prey down? You don't hear a lion go, roar, and there's a prey out there, and he's trying to sneak up on the prey, and, the lion, and then he goes, roar, and the prey goes, pew. He roars when he knocks it down, and he's standing on top of it to say, my. So the first thing that happens when Jesus comes out of heaven to a cloud is some, some voice says, you know, maybe keys and holds up the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Or says, Jesus. And so the enemy will know, here comes Jesus. And he'll be going. Rrr. So a shout happens first and then, and then, and, 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 and the trumpet of God. You know when a trumpet is blown? to designate royalty, to designate, here comes the king. Da -da 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 -da. I mean, watch that crazy English stuff where they have kings and all that kind of mess. And watch when the queen comes into something or some big royal announcement or something, and the first thing that happens is a bunch of trumpets go. And then here they come. So when royalty appears, trumpets blow. So God says, all right, when, when, when my son is coming down, we're going to have shouts and we're going to have trumpets are going to blow. And then the dead in Christ will rise first. So here's your spirit. You're dead. And here, here's your spirit with Jesus coming down out of the clouds. And, and, and your old body's laying down there on the earth somewhere. You, you cremated it. And there's a bunch of dust still flowing out and you had somebody take you out to the Bay of San Francisco or something, sprinkle your ashes or down to the muds of Mississippi and sprinkle your ashes or out on your hunting stand in, in you know, in Tubuck you know, County or something. And you, you know, you're all scattered out there or you're at your favorite fishing hole or you're laid in a, in a, in a, in a casket and now you're all dried up, withered up, something or another, sealed in some tomb somewhere. You're in a mausoleum and so forth and all that kind of stuff. 
Doesn't matter where some shark ate you up, you drowned in the sea, they never found you. I mean, what a, whatever, a bunch of shrimp have, have you now, you know? And somebody ate the shrimp, and now they got part of you on the inside of them, and you got all... Man, shrimp, shrimp are scavengers of the sea, man. Shrimp are buzzards. I don't know if you know this. Some, some crab leg, you know. You ate it at Red Lobster or whatever, and now you got granny in you, you know, because of crabbing. Piece of granny. I mean, look, what, what I'm saying is it doesn't matter where you are because the essence of you is going to be reconstructed and come join you in the clouds so that the physical you that was created by God joins the spiritual you, which is already in heaven, and now you are complete. Now, I don't know why this has to happen because I don't know what the physical body has to do with the spiritual body, but evidently it's important for them to be reunited or God would not do this. Evidently, there's an essence of you that is in your body that is important to be reunited with the real you, which is a spirit. Everybody say, I am a spirit. I have a body. And I have a soul. I live in a body is what I should have said. This right here is just the house I live in. It's not the real me. And one day they're going to bury this or burn this or whatever they're going to do to it but because I don't need it anymore. The real me's already gone to heaven. This is just the shell I used to live in, but it's an important part of the essence of me. I guess it's so in heaven when I'm walking down the street, you can look at me saying, that Pastor, you can't pass keys, that you? Because there's gonna be something that kind of looks like me maybe. You know, I mean, maybe some essence of me and you'll be able to recognize me and you'll be saying, man, is that you, Pastor? And I'm gonna say, yeah. <laughs> shaking my hair. I'm going to say, yeah, it is. And you're going to say, wow, what an improvement. I'm going, yeah, praise him. <laughs> so he said, this, you need to know this. That's what it's going to be. And, and thus shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So he says, if th this, ought to, this ought to bring you some comfort. This ought to bring you some, some, some peace in your life that those loved ones who died in Christ they're just waiting there to come on back, man. They're going to be with him. They're going to come down with him. And then the, your bodies are going to start recollecting. If you're, if you're still alive, great. You just float off this earth. To describe that would be, you know, uh, truck drivers that know the Lord. Their big rigs are going to just careen off the highways. Uh, drivers, uh, you better hope we have remote control cars that can drive themselves. Because if your driver is saved and you're not, you're going on a ride for your life. I mean, planes, pilots, Christian pilots are going to be raptured and planes are going down everywhere. Uh, people are going to be sitting at their breakfast table and half the family is going to disappear and neighbors are going to be gone and people are going to be running down the streets going, where's everybody? I miss mama. I miss daddy. I mean, it's going to be the most amazing thing that ever happened. And we're going to fly away to be with him. And I'm going, what a way to fly. It's the only way to fly. But if you're not ready, you're going to miss that. And it's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye when you least expect it, like a thief in the night, like a pregnant woman. Once it happens, it triggers a series of events that begin to happen closer and closer and closer and harder and harder and harder. That's what he's trying to say in these. Look at 1 Corinthians 51. I'm, I'm going to quit, I promise. Behold, I show you a mystery. I know it. Behold, I show you a mystery. All right, here's what the Apostle Paul is saying. The Holy Spirit has opened up a mystery to me. A mystery to everybody that's ever lived on the earth. This is a mystery. And the reason he has to say this is because he's saying uh, the Spirit has never said this to everybody. So it's still a mystery. Nobody knows about this, but the Holy Spirit just shared with me something that all of you guys want to know that nobody has ever heard, and God has never spoken about it anywhere. So it's mysterious to us, but I'm going to give you the answer so it's not a mystery anymore. He says, here's what the Holy Spirit said you need to know. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That, by the way, is that, is that still on the walls of our nursery? That's, that's a good nursery verse, right? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Think about it. I'll get you tomorrow. Hey, look, don't be so serious, man. Y'all, you guys got to lighten up. 
That's supposed to be a joke. It's sad when you got to ask people, would you please clap, you know? Hey, man, y'all are so scared. Are you scared or something or what? I mean, it's like, that's funny, actually. We're not, shall, we shall not all be, be we, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. All right, bless you, Lord. Oh, when I have to tell you, it doesn't count, so don't worry. But, but, but here it is. We're not all going to die, but all of us are going to be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Incorruptible means something that can't perish, something that can't corrode, something that doesn't get old, something that doesn't wear out, something that, look, in heaven there are no cancer wards, in heaven there are no hospital wings, in heaven there are no uh, cardiac units. In heaven, nothing corrodes, nothing corrupts, nothing weak, nothing sad, nothing diseased. And this body shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Look at this. Oh my goodness, it's just amazing. That's what happens. And if you're not... If you're not saved, if you don't know him, if you've never invited him in, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be left behind. And the reason I say this is because Matthew says, and if I, if I put it on the screen, but I don't have time because I will start preaching, it just says a bunch of stuff is going to be happening just like it happens every day. And every day, uh, people are marrying, giving in marriage. Uh, they're going to the shopping center. Dads are going to be bringing daughters down the aisle. Preachers are going to be standing up and, and, and reciting the vows. And you go into the grocery store, and some of you are going to be down at the outlet mall, and some of you are going to be at the house. You're going to be watching Sports Center and blah, blah, blah. Life as usual. And then, then, boom, something's going to happen, and you're just going to be, whoa! And he said, two of you are going to be working in the field. One's going to be taken. One's going to be left. Two of you, uh, some, two of you, what does it say? One woman grinding at the mill. One taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord comes. So I'm just saying, if you're not ready, you're going to get left behind. Why would one be taken and one be left? Because one's fat and one's skinny? Because one's pretty and one's ugly? Because one is American and the other is uh, Asian? Yeah, I mean... Why, why would one be taken and one be left? There's only one answer, because one's ready and one's not. That's the only reason you would be left behind is if Christ is not the king of your life. If he's not king, make him king. Or get ready to get left behind. Boy, if you get left behind, you know what you're going to be left behind to? The greatest world, the greatest trouble this world has ever seen. And we're going to have about 18 chapters that I'm fixing to start preaching on in Revelation that are going to show you just how bad it is. You don't want to be there. Look at your neighbor and say, you don't want to be there. And if you miss the rapture after having an opportunity to respond to the truth, you will never have another chance. This is clearly, clearly what 2 Thessalonians teaches. And it says, let no one deceive you. You've got the listing there. Go home and read it. But all it basically says is, if you had an opportunity to receive the truth and you said, no, I'll do it later, or eh, I'll get around to it, or eh, and boom, that trumpet blows and we get lifted out of here and you're standing there, you walk to church next Sunday and knock on those doors and there's nobody in there. And you go, man, Freedom River must have shut down. And then, you'll, then your buddy will come up and stand beside you because he missed it too and you'll be both looking in there going, where is everybody? You'll look across at other churches and they'll be packed out with people and all that kind of stuff because now everybody's concerned about their soul. And the churches will be full and they'll have preachers up there preaching because they'll get left too because they don't know the Lord. And everybody get all nervous. Well, I want to go to heaven when I die. I don't want to be in this horrible time. Does anybody know what the Bible said is going to happen next? <laughs> but it's going to be too late. Because you are hearing what you must do now. And if you hear it now, according to these verses, and I don't even have to read them for you. You can read them for yourself. It doesn't take a preacher to decipher this. These verses say you will be deceived by God, not the devil. He doesn't say the devil's going to trick you and you're going to be... No, 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 no. God says, and I'm going to send them strong delusion. 
Well, you say, what is delusion? Delusion is this lunacy. I tell you, you can watch it every day. Just, just, just watch any of the news agency. That's delusion. I mean, just whatever. Just make it up. Just do whatever. I mean, let's just, you know, I mean, it's clearly this, but let's don't acknowledge it. Let's just say what else, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's delusion. Delusion. And you're going to say, yeah, you're going to say, well, I guess E.T. phoned home and everybody got me. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good to me. Well, those waskly washings finally got their way. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Well, North Korea sent a bomb and blew everybody up. Yeah, sounds good to me. So, then get ready, get ready for the greatest trouble you've ever seen in the history of this life, and you're going to hate every moment of it. And you're going to cry for the mountains to fall on you and, and kill you, but you're not going to be able to die. It's going to be horrible, man. Terrible, way worse than I can even describe. So I'm just saying, if you don't know Jesus, you better come on while grace is still alive. I'm not trying to scare you. It's your choice. You can go and do all that if you want to. I mean, you're, it's your choice. I'm not going to be here. I'll be gone. Don't be looking for Pastor Keith. I mean, where, um, where, what happened to that old man? I don't know. He's just walking down the road, and all of a sudden, he was gone. I mean, of course, I'm, you know, I might I'll be, you know, be in, hopefully in good health and life and everything else, and they'll just say, man, he just, just walked off the earth. So I'm inviting you to come. Won't you stand to your feet? God.